All right, so in this final lecture, we're going to wrap up Unit 5. We're going to wrap up the 1950s and talk a little bit about what awaits the United States in the next decade, in the 1960s. So the final moment of the decade in the 1950s, the kind of capping event, is the election in 1960. And this election is a kind of capstone event for a number of reasons. It's a culmination of technology that's de developed and popularized over the course of the decade, uh, and it indicates a new direction away from traditional politics of the 1950s and towards new politics and a new left, if you like, in the 1960s. So in the election of 1960s, we see the Republican Party pitting Vice President Richard Nixon against the Democratic Party's nomination of junior Senator John F. Kennedy. Now, Richard Nixon has had a fairly long political career at this point. He served in Congress and he served as the vice president, and he seemed like a relatively good choice for the nomination. He's competent, um, kind of knows what's going on. Um, Kennedy is a relative newcomer onto the scene. He's a junior senator, as I mentioned, from Massachusetts. And uh, he does have some political background. His father served as an ambassador to Great Britain back in the 30s um, under Roosevelt. And uh, very wealthy family, uh, sort of dynasty up in Massachusetts. Kennedy himself had a distinguished work record during the Second World War, serving on PT boats. Uh, but he does have one drawback to running for president, and that's that he's Catholic. No Catholic had ever been elected president of the United States before, and it's often because there is concern, often exacerbated by political opponents, that uh, a Catholic person won't be able to completely commit to serving the nation, that they'll always be serving this second master in the form of the Pope. And that does get bandied about at, Ken at Kennedy in the same way that it was at previous candidates who were Catholic. Uh, but the Catholic issue is going to be somewhat less of an issue for Kennedy. The Second World War and the promotion of tolerance kind of diminished anti-Catholic feeling uh, to some extent. However, there are many Protestant Americans who are still reluctant to vote for a Catholic, feeling that he would support church doctrine on controversial issues or even take orders from the Pope. Old fear that uh, has been had in previous elections. To kind of try and counterbalance this as well as to deal with the uh, flip of southern states that we saw happening a little bit with the election of Eisenhower, Kennedy nominates as his vice presidential running mate, Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas. Johnson is a senior member of Congress. He'd been in either the House of Representatives or the Senate since the 30s. He was a New Deal Democrat under Roosevelt and knew very well how to manipulate the political system and get things done that he wanted. Johnson was also not only from the South, useful to court Southern voters, Southern voters who had actually for the first time in history voted in great numbers for a Republican in the last election with Eisenhower. Um, but Johnson was also Protestant, where Kennedy was Catholic, and so that would kind of counterbalance him uh, in that sense as well. Now, of course, the Cold War is going to be a major issue, and on that issue, the two candidates didn't really have all that much difference between them. Both of them were ardent Cold Warriors, pointing to Sputnik and the Soviets launching the first ICBM as proof that the United States had lost its sense of national purpose necessary to fight the Cold War, and Kennedy especially enjoyed highlighting the missile gap, the idea that the Soviet Union was far outstripping the United States in terms of missile production. Now, in reality, there was a missile gap, but the benefit was entirely on the side of the United States. The United States at this point is starting to pull away from the Soviet Union, the Soviets not being able to keep up with the expense 
of the arms race, and it's really starting to show some cracks in the Soviet system um, with making those expensive uh, weapons and things like that. So the missile gap does come does exist, but it's entirely to the advantage of the United States. Both men know this, uh, although it's not something that is widely sort of bandied about. Perhaps the most influential thing in the election of 1960, however, was the television. The election of Eisenhower previously was the first to really utilize television ads and things like that, but 1960 is the first time we see a televised presidential debate, and that's going to have a huge impact on how both of these men are perceived by the public. Kennedy was kind of a natural on television. He was comfortable and glamorous. He spoke with ease. Nixon, not so much. Uh, And so the presidential debate had an interesting outcome. For those Americans that watched it on TV, they would have reported that Kennedy was the hands-down winner of the debate. He looked cool and comfortable, Whereas Nixon came off as kind of tired and nervous looking, even. However, not being able to pick up on visual cues, listeners who tuned into the debate on the radio overwhelmingly gave the victory to Nixon. Nixon, who is at this point a much more seasoned politician than Kennedy is. Uh, And so just listening to what he was saying, he actually gave a more impressive performance. But the TV and the fact that Kennedy is able to eke out a victory largely because of his success in these televised debates really show how important this medium is going to be in future presidential elections. And it definitely has an impact on Nixon. Nixon, who goes on in 1968 to successfully run for president, is a completely different Richard Nixon running for president in 1968 than he is in 1960. Um, That Richard Nixon hires basically a PR team to craft his image to something that would be more acceptable and more attractive to a television viewer um, in that case as well. So Nixon's going to learn from this. Kennedy does eke out, like I say, a very slim victory, winning the popular vote by only 120,000 votes. Now, Eisenhower is going to attempt to revive the uh, presidential tradition from George Washington of giving a farewell address, and Eisenhower's farewell address is also going to act as a nice sort of capstone to this period of America's history. This period where we see America's commitment to the Cold War growing, but we would still have a point at which we could back away. And in Eisenhower's farewell address, he almost seems to be recommending that perhaps we should back away, warning explicitly about what he called the military-industrial complex. Just before he leaves office, he delivers a rather frank TV message warning about drumbeat calls for military buildup and urges Americans to think about the dangerous power of this military-industrial complex. Military-industrial complex being the conjunction of a mass military establishment and a permanent arms industry. He says, quote, we must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. However, also like Washington, very few Americans heeded Eisenhower's concern and instead saw the combination as a source of jobs and national security, ensuring that America's Cold War would continue pace. Now, the 1950s are a kind of conformist age, but as we've kind of looked at, there are some cracks beneath the surface, and the underpinnings of that stable, idyllic 1950s life are in disarray at this point, and those are going to start to show through as we move on into the 60s and the 70s. The millions of cars Americans are driving are spewing toxic lead into the atmosphere, Chemical insecticides that enable the production of vast amounts of food are also poisoning farm workers, consumers, and the water supply. Housewives are rebelling against the confinement of their suburban existences, and black Americans are increasingly impatient with the sluggish progress of the civil rights movement. It does, in fact, lay the groundwork for the U.S. to enter its most turbulent decade in the 1960s, which sadly we won't get the chance to discuss. 
in this class. So that kind of wraps up the 1950s and Unit 5 and the course.